Coming up on Motor Week, Brendan Coogan gets our first drive of the Jaguar X-Type. Rob Hallam has a UK test of the Lexus RX 300 and Glenda Mackay has some topless fun in the new Peugeot 206cc. This is one of the most talked about cars of the year. It's Jaguar's new X-Type, the Baby Jag. It's their £22,000 answer to the entry-level compact executive car. And it's their first attempt at cracking a market that so far has been dominated by the BMW 3 Series. So, have Jaguar managed to create a new car for a mark that's traditionally for old duffers, for younger buyers? And will this cat set the pigeons flapping? Well, for starters, the car manages to undercut the opposition by some considerable margin. The BMW 325Ti and the Audi A4 3.0-litre and the C-Class Mercedes are all considerably more wonga. And I can see they're already looking considerably flustered. The X-Type unmistakably oozes Jaguarness. From the front, it looks like an XJ8 and from the rear, of an XK8. The headlamps and grille clearly mark it down as a Jag in a way that's clearly associated with the brand. The design of the X-Type is more mature than the S-Type and the rear of the car certainly isn't as cluttered. Now under Ford's parentage, Jaguar has been economical to say the least when raiding the parts bin. That's because the cost of developing an all new floor plan would have been prohibitive. Now the X-Type chassis is heavily based on a Mondeo floor pan, but while the Mondeo was the right size, the drive was at the wrong end to be a real Jag, which is where the idea for the four-wheel drive came in. So on all X-Types now, 40% of the drive is on the rear wheels to eliminate understeer. There were already V6 engines in the S-Type, which is the same V6 Duratec that you get in the Mondeo, only with a Jaguar head. Which is why this X-Type Jag will come with two engine options, 2.5 litre and 3 litre, because that's what's available to the company. So is this just a Mondeo in drag with four-wheel drive and better suspension? Well, no, because for this car to succeed, it has to look and feel like a Jaguar, inside and out. And guess what? Does. The interior is definitely not Ford based. The leather upholstery and design is much better than the larger S-Type which was criticised for having too much plastic in the cabin and not having that real Jaguar ambience. Whereas in the X-Type it has got that sumptuous feel about it. Although I have to say some of the switches on the central console and the indicator stalks look a little familiar. Now when you think of a Jaguar, you obviously have to think of Toys R Us for the executive and this car is no exception. It's got climate control, it's got cruise control, everything's electrical. But the CD changer and the sat-nav system are extras and quite costly ones at that. Dynamically, the X-Type will perform toe-to-toe -to -toe with the BMW 3 Series. It'll outrun the BMW Compact in a 0-60 dash and is capable of a top whack of 140 miles per hour. And it'll do an economical 39 miles per gallon, although the 3 litre is obviously a bit more thirsty. But if you're looking at four-wheel drive cars, you have to say that the Audi A4 is its natural competitor, but at 25 grand, it's a bit more cash. And I have to say the Jaguar is more of a driver's car rather than the Audi's motorway punt. Traditionally, buying a Jaguar was like taking swimming lessons with lead boots on because chances are the resale value would drop like a stone. So the question is, have Jaguar improved their build quality so that they can compete with the likes of BMW and Mercedes in terms of depreciation? Well, the answer is, we think so. Despite its relations with Ford, this is a Jag through and through. Now in the UK we're quite snobbish when it comes to style and we're far more likely to buy something that's European rather than Japanese if we want to make a statement. Bang & Olufsen over Sony, Rolex over Seiko and Mercedes over Lexus. 
But in America, they've got a completely different view of things because Lexus not only outsells Mercedes and BMW, but it does all that while still maintaining the image of a luxury brand. Now inside the RX300, you'd be forgiven if you thought you were driving a hearse because black is the theme here. We've got a black dashboard, black door panels, black door inserts and black seats, but we are saved with the quite classy aluminium inserts on the centre console and around the electric mirror and window switches. Now the dashboard itself, whilst not being the last word in style, it is extremely well laid out. All the instruments are very clear, very easy to read and the switch gear is everything you'd expect from a luxury car. But the only niggle I've got really is the indicator stalks. They look like they come straight out of the Toyota Yaris parts bin. On the outside, there's no getting away from the fact that this Lexus is big. Not only is it long, but it's also very tall on those 16 inch wheels and tires. And as far as the looks go, well, I don't think we'll be winning any beauty pageants, but to criticize it for that would miss the point. I mean, if you want to sell lingerie, you don't get WWF wrestlers to model it for you. Unless you're into that sort of thing. If you want glamour, buy a sports car. Now, ever since Lexus launched the first car, the LS400, they've had a reputation for producing very quiet vehicles. And this, the RX300, is no exception. There's almost zero traffic noise around town. And it's only when you get out onto the motorway and the wind starts puppeting these fairly big wing mirrors that you get any noise intrusion. But if it gets too bad, just turn up the fantastic stereo system. Well, the RX300 is no slouch, performance is brisk rather than frantic. The six cylinder, three litre unit pumps out 280 brake horsepower, enough to propel the car from 0 to 60 in a little over nine seconds and onto a top speed of 112 miles an hour. Hurrying the car along hurts the fuel consumption though, and you'll be lucky to see over 22 miles to the gallon. Now, with full time four wheel drive and a reasonably stiff suspension, the RX300 is very, very smooth on the bends. Potholes, drain covers, they make very little difference to the composure and it's only when you get onto some of the sharper corners that you notice a little bit of body roll. And that lets you know that although you're driving a luxury vehicle, it's not a saloon car. Now another great reputation Lexus have is giving you shed loads of kit in your standard car. And at 29 grand, your RX300 is going to have driver passenger airbags electric mirrors, windows, air conditioning, alloy wheels and a CD player. Now if you want to pay a little bit more and go for the SE model, that's the one we're driving today and it'll set you back 32 and a half grand. You also get cruise control, electric sunroof and the lovely heated leather electric seats. Now whilst Lexus may have spent the last three years fine tuning the RX300 for Europe, the competition haven't been standing still. In fact, the very popular Mercedes ML leads the sales figures in this sector, and BMW have just launched a 3-litre version of their brilliant X5. However, with the 3-litre X5 costing around 33 grand and Mercedes ML weighing in at just over 30 grand, the RX300 looks a good buy, especially when you consider the levels of equipment the car boasts of its rivals. Now, whilst it may be a while in the UK before Lexus has a badge recognition of BMW and Mercedes, that is about all they're lacking because on all-round ability, specification and price, they've got a lot to have the Germans quaking in their lederhosen. A luxury romantic hotel on the edge of the Italian lakes. A new car to drive, what could be better? Except it's February, it's cold, it's misty, and it's raining. Of course, everybody thinks the Mini MPV is a new sector in the motor industry, but nothing's further from the truth. In fact, the first in Mini MP came out in the mid-1950s here in Italy with the Fiat 600 Multipla. The Daihatsu YRV is the latest example of the genre. Daihatsu says YRV stands for Young Recreational Vehicle. The fact that the front seats fold flat forward and the rear seats fold flat back to make a double bed indicates the sort of recreational use the young might make of it. The press release describes the YRV as having the interior space of a Golf 
inside the external dimensions of a Fiesta-sized car, and they also point out it's very, very close in external dimensions to the Audi A2, but there the similarity ends. This is not an Audi by any stretch of the imagination, but of course it is £4,000 cheaper. The 1.3-litre engine does give it a fair amount of punch, 110 miles an hour, almost maximum speed, a 0-60 figure around about 10 seconds, and a acclaimed 55 miles to the gallon, but not all at the same time. They've avoided having a low-spec, entry-level car, but there's three versions, a thousand pounds separating each, and you get ABS and electronic brake force distribution, and different airbags and uh, CD player according to the spec you choose. But even this base model is pretty well equipped. As you'd expect from the compact dimensions, uh, relatively handy little car, it seems to hold the road quite well, it goes well, it's easy to drive. What more can you say about this class of Japanese car. It's not the most stylish little box on the road. Daihatsu make much of the double wedge line to the side windows, but it's hardly an earth-shattering shape. Prices, well, 9,500 for the entry car, 10,500 with air conditioning, ABS and alloys, and 11,500 with automatic and CD. It's not cheap, especially since opposition from the majors, Ford, Vauxhall, Fiat and Renault are all offering such fiercely competitive deals at the moment. It's quite comfortable, the noise levels aren't excessive. It's quite well trimmed, nice choice of material inside. Goes on sale in March and there's a, a turbo version coming later on in the year with 140 brake horsepower. That should be quite fun. As you'd expect for this kind of vehicle, the rear seating is flexible to say the least. Reasonable legroom with the seat in this position or you can slide it right forward to give you much more leg space and because you're so high in the vehicle you still get reasonable amount of legroom anyway. The tailgate opens really high for a little car so you don't bang your head. A neat uh, tray in the luggage compartment with these extensions to make sure your luggage is on a flat surface and underneath the tray well oddman stowage so you can put the odd bottle in it and the spare wheel underneath unfortunately a space saver which i hate i wish they'd give us a full-size spare Daihatsu say that they anticipate the YRV will make up 30% of all their sales next year. These sort of prices, they could well be right. Still to come on Moto Week, Richard Hammond puts Audi's all road through its paces and we subject Glenda Mackay to some harsh Yorkshire weather conditions. a good one right you'll love this what do you get if you cross a sheep with a kangaroo well probably quite an expensive lawsuit and you certainly open up an interesting moral debate but we do love our hybrids it's the same with everything we won't settle for just a food processor it's got to double up as a letter opener and shower cap as well and the same goes for our cars we want that bit extra that's why audi invented the a6 avant and a state car crossed with a sports car now they've done it again with this the all-road and a state car crossed with a sports car crossed with an off-roader. The result? Surely a big wobbly bag of compromises. But we'll find out. Drive the petrol engine version in a bit of a hurry and you'll start to see you would dream of in an ordinary off-roader. 0-60 comes up in a shade under 8 seconds, a top speed 147 miles an hour, and all with that sure-footed, almost sports car handling. Start to drift off-road, we're rocking and rolling. 
it copes extremely well. Because we're not a huge cumbersome off-roader, it can actually skip along the smaller bumps very well indeed. Audi's interiors can hold their head up in any company. I rate them as amongst the very best in the world. So it's good news that there's no disappointment in here. It's every bit an A6 Avant. Beautiful, clean, sharp lines everywhere. And every single bit made of the best quality materials and fitted beautifully. There's no stray lines or big gaps. There's all the usual kit you'd expect to find on board. We've got sophisticated satellite navigation, electrical everything, including my seat. But we've also got one interesting little panel here, and it's a big giveaway that this is actually a pretty serious car. It's down here. Because when Audi named it the All Road, they did so with good reason. It's suitable for all roads, and that's not just because it has the Quattro four-wheel drive system. It also has a very clever air suspension system, which allows it to vary the ride height according to the conditions. Let me explain and demonstrate. Right now, we're at normal. About there, for ordinary day-to-day -day driving around town. If you go over 75 miles an hour or press the button to lower it, it automatically drops to its lower position, streamlined for going really fast. If you want to go a bit off-road, you hit the button, you go up, past normal, and onto high one. We've got a bit of extra ground clearance, so we don't catch anything underneath, fine. If it gets really tough, we can hit the button again, and we go up to high two. We're really high up, nothing can catch us, and we're safe. That's the theory, that's just me jumping up and down. Don't know how it works in the car, so we'll try it, and we'll try it on all roads. It is surprising. With this system, you can get an Audi into places that you really don't expect to see an Audi. And more importantly, you can get it out again. Driving as I was, the automatic is certainly not ideal for off-roading. This one doesn't have the optional low-ratio gearbox either, so going downhill, I had to put the brakes on, which can mean locking an occasional wheel. It does get a bit alarming, but we certainly got ran unscathed. Mind you, part of me was wondering, would I really want to take an estate car that costs between 32 and 36,000 pounds off-road at all, where the body could get all dinged and scratched? Mind you, if you got the money to pay for the car, you'd probably have the money to have all the blemishes taken out. So, does this most compromised of cars actually work? Well, it does manage to take all the best bits of the three cars that go to make it up, and none of the worst. It does have decent off-road ability without being as big as your house and thirsty than you'd ever want to pay for. It's certainly got practical estate car capabilities, but it doesn't look boring and bland. It looks great, in fact. And yes, it's certainly a sports car, but it's not as small and pokey as most ordinary sports cars. So, yes, it does work. Right, I've got to go and collect my new combined hat stand, toothbrush and roller skate, so I'll be off. Hey. As much as we like to get a bit of top-down motor in action as soon as the sun comes out here in the UK, to be honest, it's not totally practical. Let me demonstrate. Because not only do you need a convertible car and a sunny day, you also need a daft woolly hat, a scarf, some gloves and the world's thickest padded coat. But since this Peugeot 206 CC is so absolutely gorgeous and I am willing to suffer for my art, I'm going to pretend that it's 90 degrees in the shade and I'm in lovely, sunny Spain. <sighs> and now I'm languishing around here in the sunshine. I, uh, I better tell you about how the car performs. Well, for a convertible, it really does feel quite stable. And this is because it gets off to a great start chassis-wise, being based on the ever-popular 206 GTI. Now, as with any drop top, when you get onto the more bumpy, windy Moreland roads like this one, there is a certain amount of body rattle and shake. But uh, it doesn't detract from the wonderful experience of soft top driving. I mean, it's fantastic. It's, it's lovely and warm and I'm not cold at all. Honestly. All that said, there's plenty of room up front to stretch out, spread out and... Look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't go on anymore. Sorry.
I am blooming freezing. So I've got a choice. I can either put all my snowman gear back on and soldier on. I can put in the car in the garage until I thaw out a bit. Or I can get all together and get a much more practical coupe. Hmm. I think it's coupe time. Watch this. The hood stowage area actually hides a very nifty, clever fold-down metal roof. So in effect, we've got two cars in one. A coupe and a convertible. And it's the name so the touristic CC. Now with the roof on, this car feels a lot more like the 206 GTI that it's based on. But it's not as nippy or as agile. But then again, this two litre engine has got more weight to pull around with the roof system and the reinforced chassis. Now at the moment, this car is only available in a two litre version and that's going to set you back a sunny £16,000, which is two grand more than the Renault Megane convertible. But then again, this car is a lot more practical for all year round usage. The good news is there's going to be a 1.6 version available soon and that's going to be around £1,500 cheaper. Well, for me at least, this time of year is not time for driving round with the hood down. But could I live with this car all year round? Yeah, I reckon I probably could. It certainly looks fantastic and it's from Good Heritage. And with this metal top rather than the normal material soft top, it's a much more secure option. But if you really want me to drive it back with the hood down... Roll on August! Be sure to watch next week's Motor Week as we've got a three-way Super Mini Royal Rumble with the VW Polo, Toyota Yaris and Vauxhall's new Corsa.